The country is still reeling from the horrific shooting at Robb Elementary School in Uvalde, Texas, where 18-year-old Salvador Ramos entered the school and killed 19 children and two adults. Clinical psychologist Peter Langman has researched and studied what motivates school shooters. In his book, Warning Signs, Identifying School Shooters Before They Strike, he not only looks at why school shooters act, but how they can be prevented. Peter is joining us now. Welcome to the show. Thank you. So Peter, help us understand what are the warning signs, and if these warning signs exist, how, why aren't they more frequently caught and these shooters intercepted? So there's all kinds of warning signs that students are planning an attack, and often they are surprisingly explicit. Mm. Sometimes students will simply tell their friends, I'm coming to school with a gun, I'm gonna do a shooting. And when it's that explicit, kids tend not to take it seriously. So one of the barriers is getting students to take reports of threats seriously. Sometimes besides simply announcing their intentions, the perpetrator will warn friends to stay away from school on a certain day because they don't want their friends to get hurt. In other cases, they may try to recruit a peer to join them in the attack. In most cases, a peer says no, but they often don't report that invitation. So again, there's a lot of missed opportunities Sometimes uh, students may be less explicit and just tell their friends they're going to do something that's going to get them either killed or in jail, or they may say there's going to be a bad day or I'm going to do something evil on Friday. These are all warning signs that need to be taken seriously and reported. Yeah, and then it seems like the obvious next step would to limit their access to any sort of weapons that would then allow them to do something like this. But can you go into the psychology of these school shooters. So we see that there's these warning signs. Maybe schools need to start having some sort of like shooter ed, I guess, where it's, you know, here's the warning signs. Here's what to spot. This is what you should do. If you see something, say something. I'm sure they're already doing something like that. But what about the, what, what leads a kid to become a school shooter, to even get to that point in the first place? You know, there's a lot of people who will focus on a single cause as the explanation. And they may point to bullying or they may point to video games, you know, violent films and so on. And what we need to recognize is this is a very complex phenomenon. There's no one simple cause we can point to. There's a whole lot of different factors. From a psychological standpoint, I've identified three different types of school shooters. But before going into those three types, I also need to just emphasize that most people who have those traits or symptoms never kill anybody. So these are not complete explanations, but they help us understand the kind of things that are going on inside the perpetrators. So the first type is what I call the psychopathic school shooter. And this is someone who's just incredibly narcissistic. They don't have empathy for other people. They're just essentially cold-blooded, callous, and often sadistic and they get a kind of thrill out of having the power to hurt and kill people. Now, in contrast to them, there's the psychotic school shooters. And these are people who are struggling with significant mental health issues. For example, they may be hearing voices telling them to kill themselves and other people. They may have paranoid delusions that people are going to hurt or kill them, so they have to act first. So this is where the issue of uh, mental illness comes into play. But again, most people with these symptoms are not dangerous. So this is part of the explanation, but not the whole explanation. And finally, in contrast to the psychopathic and psychotic shooters who typically come from essentially stable intact families, the third category is the traumatized school shooters. And these are children who, who grow up in severely and chronically violent dysfunctional families. So the parents have drug or alcohol addictions, the parents have criminal behavior, there's physical abuse, there may be sexual abuse, either in the home or in the community or in a foster home that these kids end up in. So what we have is three very different pathways to the same act. They all commit school shootings, but how they got to that point and why they're doing it can vary dramatically. Peter, do you have a sense of how you would characterize the Buffalo shooter and the Uvalde shooter? You know, when we look at recent incidents, it's really too early to 
say too much about them psychologically. Often it takes months and sometimes years for really detailed inside information to become available. So at this point, you know, I don't want to say too much about the recent perpetrators. Um, I, I suspect a lot more information will come out that will shed some light on their motivations. So Peter, is, does this, these psychology types that you just mentioned, do these apply to, you know, and even the warning signs that you brought up earlier with, you know, saying to people, I'm going to do something or these various different behaviors, does this apply not only to school shooters, but does this also apply to the other mass shootings that we see where people are in their 20s, 30s, even into their 60s, like in the Las Vegas shooting, for example? You know, I've looked at perpetrators of other types of mass attacks, including ideological killers, whether that's uh, white supremacists or uh, domestic jihadists. And I tend to see the same dynamics. I do think that typology is relevant for other types of shooters. I've published some articles on other types of perpetrators, looking at them through that same lens. And the dynamics, the, the life histories, the personality traits tend to be very similar to what we see among the school shooters. With the warning signs, my impression is that the juvenile shooters, the middle school and high school kids who commit these attacks, tend to be a lot more open about what they're going to do. The adult shooters may be more careful about what they disclose, but even there, there's often warning signs that people could report if they were trained to do so and knew where to turn with that information. As people debate, whether or not mental health should be the focus here. I think part of the issue is that it's not clear what kind of mental health interventions could actually prevent something like this from happening. There seems to be a sense that there's a bigger cultural issue where people are feeling isolated. Maybe in some cases they're bullied. Maybe in some cases they have parents that aren't as present in the home due to a whole host of complex socioeconomic factors and on and on and on. Do you have a sense of if 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 you, what you want if someone wanted to prioritize mental in, illness over certain kind of gun control measures, what if any kinds of interventions could actually meaningfully decrease the number of mass shootings in this country? And I think first we have to distinguish or discuss the issue of mental illness and what people mean by that. You know, most people with mental illness are not dangerous. However, right. some perpetrators may have some kind of mental health issues. And in a broader sense, to me, anyone who's committing mass murder has some kind of psychological issues. Even if we just call that extreme anger or rage, a desire for revenge, a desire for recognition, these are psychological issues that could be addressed. Now, in terms of looking at the perpetrators through the lens of the typology, you know, for children living in traumatic households, that's an area where you know, child protective services could get involved and either stabilize the home, remove the child if necessary to keep the child safe, provide treatment for, you know, post-traumatic stress symptoms and so on. For someone who may have psychotic symptoms, there's, you know, individual treatment and medication that can address those issues. So really what that intervention would look like would vary from person to person. And another factor to keep in mind is many of these perpetrators are also depressed and suicidal. So if we did a better job of recognizing depression and, and students who are struggling with suicidal thoughts and provided intervention for them, we would not only save their lives, but might also be saving the lives of other people because they may also be homicidal at the same time. Hmm. So does that look like, you know, more support in the school context with more, you know, support for school psychologists and perhaps hiring more and having more regular meetings with kids. I mean, from a policy perspective, I, I, I know you're not a, a legislator, but have you considered from a policy perspective what that would look like? Because we do seem to be having these battles where, you know, someone on the left might want to push, well, this is why we want to have universal health care and have free access to mental health care for all Americans. Somebody else might want to push, well, this is why schools need more funding so that they can hire staff that can attend to kids in these ways. Some other people who may, might be more concerned will say, well, this is why we need to have more support for families and perhaps, you know, maybe a child tax credit or something else that will give families resources to stay home with their kid or be more present and things like that. I mean, but I think kind of lost in all of that is 
a lot of people are struggling to your point. A lot of people have mental health issues and they don't become killers. Is an intervention like that really going to be dispositive in changing outcomes here as opposed to kind of comprehensive um, common sense gun regulation? I certainly think anything that can increase people's access and willingness to use mental health services is a step in the right direction. So besides policy, there's the whole issue of destigmatizing mental health issues and mental health treatment. I would like to see that going to your psychologist is as routine as going to your dentist or your pediatrician. I would love to see people have an annual mental health checkup the same way we have an annual physical checkup. And I think the earlier you catch things, the more effective you can be in treating them. So again, whether that's a policy or a public education effort, I think we need to destigmatize uh, mental health treatment, um, recognize that you know we all may have issues that we struggle with from now, uh, now and then, and that we could benefit from having a professional to talk to to address those issues. Well, I appreciate you spending your time with us today. Uh, it's been edifying. Thank you. And we will have more rising for you right after this. <laughs>